Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. There is perhaps no failure of the justice system more obvious than when an innocent person is locked up for a crime they didn't commit. While this can happen for a variety of reasons, such as bad forensics, investigative tunnel vision, or just plain incompetence, the results are the same. An innocent person is forced to languish behind bars while the real perpetrator walks free. While the wheels of justice often turn frustratingly slow when it comes to correcting these mistakes, thanks to the work of organizations like the Innocence Project, victims of wrongful incarceration are sometimes able to clear their names and gain their freedom. In honor of the new year, we thought it would be interesting to take a look at a few active wrongful conviction cases that we think will be interesting to watch in 2021. We should say as a disclaimer that in all of these cases, we can never be 100% sure that a person is innocent. Nonetheless, we've tried to choose stories where we feel the evidence is fairly compelling in favor of a conviction being overturned. Before we get to today's list, we just wanted to take a second to thank all of the people who've helped support the channel by watching, liking, and subscribing to Crime Zone. A couple of our latest videos have garnered way more views than normal, and we're super excited to be reaching a larger audience. To those of you who've been subscribed for a while, we couldn't have done it without your support. And to those of you who are new to the channel, Thank you for giving our content a chance. We hope that you'll stick around. We'd also ask that if you've watched a bunch of our videos and like what you see so far, to please consider subscribing or to take a moment to double check to see if you're subscribed. It really helps us to continue to grow the channel and keep making content. All right, with that out of the way, here are four wrongful conviction cases to watch in 2021. On Easter Sunday of 1991, an 18-year-old gas station attendant named William Little was killed during an apparent robbery in Bloomington, Illinois. The perpetrator appeared to have shot Little over just $60, fleeing the scene thereafter. The senseless murder enraged the community, resulting in mounting pressure on local law enforcement to solve the crime. The case landed on the desk of Detective Charles Crow, a senior member of the Bloomington Police Department. With no concrete leads in the case, Crow instead decided to take a closer look at the residents in the area with prior convictions. He eventually zeroed in on a man named Jamie Snow, whose record consisted of a 1985 petty theft charge and a 1994 obstruction of justice charge. Jamie claimed that he had been nowhere near the scene of the crime at the time of the killing. In fact, he had been having dinner with his children across town. Ultimately, Crow would come to believe that Jamie did not fit the profile of a murderer and could find no physical evidence tying him to the crime. He retired from the police department in June of 1997, with the murder of William Little still unsolved. However, in 1999, Jamie Snow's world would once again be turned upside down when he was arrested for Little's murder. It turned out that the two rookie detectives that had taken on the case and armed with Crow's old files were convinced that Jamie was their perpetrator. Additionally, for reasons unknown, they were also convinced that Jamie's sister-in-law, Susan Claycomb, was involved, insisting that she had driven the getaway car in the robbery. She was arrested at the same time as Jamie. Claycomb was offered probation in exchange for testifying against her brother-in-law, but she refused. At trial, her lawyer dismantled the state's case, and with no evidence connecting her to the crime, she was acquitted. However, when it came time for Jamie's trial, the prosecution produced a series of supposed eyewitnesses and jailhouse informants who all attested to his guilt. The state relied on three main eyewitnesses. The first was a man who claimed to have witnessed the perpetrator arguing with the victim while he went into the gas station to pay for his fuel. However, the composite sketch produced from details he provided to the police looked nothing like Jamie. In particular, the witness claimed that the perpetrator had worn an earring and had a fresh wound to his chin. Neither of these details matched Jamie Snow. The second witness was a 14-year-old boy who claimed he had seen the suspect from his house across the street from the gas station, a distance of approximately 220 feet. The boy would later admit that he had picked Jamie randomly out of a lineup because he assumed that the police had found the correct perpetrator. The prosecution's final witness was a man named Danny Martinez, who claimed that he had seen Jamie on the night of the murder while putting air in his tires in the gas station's parking lot. Though Martinez gave convincing testimony at trial, it was never disclosed that he had been unable to identify Jamie on multiple occasions shortly after the crime. Still, the prosecution made him their star witness at the trial eight years later. Similarly, the prosecution never disclosed that nearly all of their jailhouse informants received compensation in exchange for their testimony against Jamie Snow. In the years following the trial, several of them would recant their testimony, including one man who said he agreed to testify because he had been angry at Jamie over a game of cards while they were both in county jail. 
Despite obvious problems with the state's witnesses, Jamie's lawyer failed to mount a convincing defense at trial, and Jamie received a life sentence. The lawyer would himself go to prison in 2006 for defrauding an elderly client. At that trial, he would admit that he had suffered from mental illness, alcoholism, and a crippling gambling addiction. In the years since his conviction, Jamie Snow has worked tirelessly to have his conviction overturned, aided by the Chicago-based Exoneration Project. However, so far, numerous attempts have failed to gain much legal traction. In 2016, a federal court rejected a petition to reopen the conviction, saying that arguments that his lawyer was ineffective and that the state failed to disclose information were insufficient. In 2018, the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals rejected another appeal on similar grounds, saying that the case had already been reviewed dozens of times by lower courts and that the ruling had been upheld. Most recently, in 2020, Jamie Snow was one of many inmates in Illinois who applied for emergency clemency during the pandemic, though it is unclear what, if anything, materialized from this petition. His lawyers are currently waiting on a request for further forensic testing of the evidence in this case. However, this has been delayed indefinitely because of the reduced operation of Illinois courts. Hopefully in 2021, we will get some definitive answers in this case. On the evening of June 15, 1998, Bart McNeil was looking after his three-year-old daughter, Christina, at his apartment in Bloomington, Illinois. Bart was divorced from his ex-wife, Tita, but he was still very much a part of his daughter's life, and the two rotated custody often around their work schedules. On this particular evening, Tita was working the third shift at the local hospital, so Christina was spending the night with her father. At around 10.30 p.m., Bart put Christina to bed before finishing up some things around the house. A few hours later, he discovered the three-year-old awake in her bedroom, smiling and talking. Figuring that his daughter was just having trouble sleeping, Bart wasn't overly concerned and simply told her to get some sleep as he tucked her back into bed. When Bart awoke early the next morning, he began his usual routine of checking emails and preparing for work. However, when he called out to Christina to get dressed for daycare, he received no response. He entered the room and made a horrifying discovery. His daughter was lying motionless in bed with no signs of life. Though Bart quickly called 911 and attempted to perform CPR on the small child, there was nothing anyone could do. Christina had likely already been dead for hours. At first, the scene was treated like a mysterious tragedy. Bart himself thought that an unknown and sudden illness may have been to blame, possibly a result of Christina's asthma. But it quickly became clear that this was not the case. Christina had been strangled to death. As the hours dragged on, Bart began to piece together the horrific events before and after his daughter's death, when it finally clicked. He then made another series of frantic 911 calls, telling police that they had to come back to the crime scene. When investigators arrived, he told them that he knew who the killer was, his ex-girlfriend, Masuk Nolan. Bart had broken up with Masuk just the day before his daughter's death, the bitter end to a dysfunctional relationship. One of the main reasons Bart had ended things was so that he could be a better father to his daughter. Masuk could be violent and, in fact, had been arrested on domestic battery charges against Christina and Bart just a year before Christina's murder. The breakup had culminated in a loud public episode in a local restaurant. Bart also drew investigators' attention to several peculiar things in his daughter's room. A fan which had been placed near the window had been knocked to the floor. The blinds had been ruffled and slightly damaged, and the window itself seemed to have sustained damage. The window screen was slightly warped in its track, and there were two cuts made on both of the bottom corners, which would have allowed someone to access the window's latches and open it from the outside. Though police fingerprinted the window and took pictures of this evidence, it soon became clear that their main suspect in the case was Bart. A short time later, he was arrested for Christina's murder. At trial, the prosecution dismissed most of the evidence found near the bedroom window. They claimed, based on a small cobweb in the corner, that no one could have climbed through it, and also insisted that there was dust on the windowsill, something that is curiously lacking in the actual photo evidence. Additionally, Bart's defense team was forbidden from admitting any evidence into the trial regarding Masuk Nolan. He wasn't allowed to talk about the tumultuous breakup, Masuk's jealousy towards Christina, or the domestic battery charges. In July of 1999, Bart McNeil was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. 
Though he continued to maintain his innocence after his conviction, more than a decade passed before anyone took Bart seriously. That is, until another shocking crime started to attract understandable attention. In September of 2011, Masuk Nolan made headlines when she murdered her mother-in-law, Wenlin Taita. The case had eerie similarities to the murder of Christina McNeil. For starters, Wenlin was also strangled. The killing had also taken place shortly after Masuk's new husband had asked for a divorce. Finally, just like with Christina, Masuk had blamed her mother-in-law for messing up her relationship with her husband. In December of 2012, Masuk was convicted of the murder and sentenced to 55 years in prison. With the realization that Masuk was capable of murder, many more people began to believe Bart's story. The Illinois Innocence Project agreed to review his case to help him try to clear his name. In addition to the mountain of circumstantial evidence pointing to Masuk, Bart's lawyers pointed out how much of the evidence in the case had never been tested for DNA, including most of the spots on Christina's bed sheets and pillowcase, her clothing, and the window screen. This will undoubtedly be a part of their petition to reopen the case. Currently, motions have been filed with the McLean County Courthouse, and Bart's lawyers are optimistic that they will be granted a hearing sometime in 2021. On the night of April 9, 1989, a deadly house fire broke out in the city of Bell in Southern California. The home belonged to a young mother of three named Joanne Parks, who worked as a waitress in nearby Los Angeles. Though Joanne managed to survive the fire and run to a neighbor's house to call 911, help arrived too late for her children, all of whom died in the blaze. At first, the case was regarded as a simple, albeit terrible, tragedy. Joanne had put her kids to bed as usual that night before heading to sleep herself. She had awoken to screams just before midnight, finding most of her home engulfed in flames and with no choice but to escape and get help. However, two years later, the narrative would abruptly change. After consulting fire experts, police were convinced that they were dealing with an arson case. The key to this theory was the fire's supposedly multiple points of origin that investigators discovered while analyzing the scene. The experts claimed that there had actually been two fires, one that had started in the living room of the house, another that had started in the children's bedroom. If the fire had been an accident as initially thought, there should have only been one point of origin. Investigators also claimed that one of the children had been found inside a closet in the room and that the door to this closet appeared to them to be barricaded by a laundry hamper. Joanne was charged with her children's murders and at trial this evidence was used to convict her. She received a sentence of life without parole. However, as the years went by and Joanne served her sentence, she continued to maintain her innocence. At the same time, the understanding of fire evidence in forensics also underwent drastic changes, changes that would turn out to have important implications for Joanne's case. In 2011, an arson review panel led by a prominent scientific fire analyst named John Lentini reviewed the evidence in Joanne's case. The panel found serious problems with the state's case, particularly its core claim that the fire that killed Joanne's children had multiple points of origin. The panel determined that the house had experienced a phenomenon known as flashover, the almost instant ignition of all of the combustible material in a given area. This happens when the majority of exposed surfaces in an enclosed space are heated to the temperature at which they release flammable gases. When the temperature and concentration of these gases becomes high enough, entire areas can be incinerated in an instant. In 1989, this behavior of fire was not well understood, and it would have appeared to many that the fire originated in multiple places. Moreover, when the panel looked at the fire patterns near the closet door where one of Joanne's children had been found, they determined that there was no reliable evidence that anything had been barricading the door. Rather, it seemed as though the terrified child had simply run into the closet to shield themselves from the flames. The panel ultimately concluded that none of the evidence presented at Joanne's 1989 trial would have held up to scrutiny based on modern scientific standards. Thanks to the help of the California Innocence Project, Joanne was eventually granted an evidentiary hearing in 2016 based on the claim that the prosecution had presented false evidence at her trial. However, despite showing that the state's case had serious flaws, the prosecution claimed that the changes to the science didn't matter since the evidence presented at trial was technically accurate at the time. The judge in the case ultimately viewed the hearing as a battle of expert opinions and upheld Joanne's conviction. A similar scene played out when the decision was appealed in 2018. The final update in the case came in March of 2020, when Joanne was among several California Innocence Project clients who had her sentence commuted by Governor Gavin Newsom. However, the decision simply reduced Joanne's sentence to 27 years to life and made her eligible for parole. 
At the time, it was announced that her parole hearing would likely happen within the next few months, but there have been no further updates announced to the public. For now, it appears as though Joanne may be released from prison, though her name will not be cleared for the murders of her three children. According to the California Innocence Project, work will continue on Joanne's case as they fight to prove her innocence. The evening of March 11, 1985, started out completely normal for Harold and Thelma Swain of Waverly, Georgia. The elderly couple was attending Bible study with several other congregants at the predominantly black Rising Baptist Church, where Harold served as a deacon. However, sometime during the evening's activities, an unknown visitor showed up at the entranceway of the church. The man claimed he needed to speak to Harold. When Harold got up to talk to the man, he was attacked and the two began to struggle. Alarmed by the scene, Thelma went to help her husband. Moments later, both of them were shot to death by the unknown man, who fled the scene immediately afterwards. The crime shocked the local community. The Swains had not only been beloved members of their church, but well-known people in the larger community, and their murders attracted significant media coverage. A year later, police got their first major break in the case, when the ex-wife of a man named Eric Spar came forward and said that he was the murderer. According to police, the woman played a tape for them in which Spar threatened to kill her, saying that he was also behind the killings of Harold and Thelma Swain. According to the woman, the crime had been racially motivated, and Eric Spar was a racist. Adding further intrigue, the woman was also able to pick a pair of broken prescription glasses out of a photo lineup that had been recovered from the scene. She said the glasses belonged to her ex-husband. However, Spar apparently had an alibi. A man claiming to be his boss talked to police and told them that Spar had been working as an overnight stalker at a local Winn-Dixie grocery store on the night of the murders. With that, police moved on to new suspects. The case would remain cold for more than a decade, during which time the original two investigators on the case retired and a new detective was brought in to handle the case. In 1998, this detective turned his attention to a man named Dennis Perry. Perry's name had come up while the detective had been re-interviewing witnesses. One of these witnesses, a woman named Jane Beaver, told investigators that she believed that Perry was the killer because he had confessed to her about the murders while dating her daughter. She claimed that Perry wanted revenge against Harold Swain because he had asked him for money and Swain had laughed in his face. In 2003, Dennis Perry was tried and convicted for the murder of the Swains. At the trial, Beaver was the state's star witness. Some members of the jury would later say that her testimony played a critical role in their decision of guilt. However, police failed to disclose to Perry's defense that Beaver received $12,000 in reward money in exchange for her testimony. According to police files, she asked for the money the day after Perry's arrest. While the testimony alone was suspicious, there were other problems with Perry's trial. The jury was never informed about the alleged confession of Eric Spar. They were also conveniently told that the glasses found at the scene were irrelevant, since Dennis Perry didn't wear glasses and had 20-20 vision. DNA extracted from hairs found in one of the hinges of the glasses also did not belong to Perry. It would take well over a decade for many of these details to come to light when several interested parties began to re-examine the case against Dennis Perry as he languished in jail. The case was examined by the podcast Undisclosed, and was also taken on by the Georgia Innocence Project. The newspaper, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, also began extensive investigative reporting on the story. It was discovered that there were serious problems with the so-called alibi of Eric Spar. It turned out that none of the identifying details listed in police files about the man who had vouched for Spar while he was being investigated actually matched the details of his boss at the time. This included his date of birth, social security number, address, and home and work numbers. When the Atlanta Journal-Constitution tracked down the man who actually managed the store where Spar had worked in 1985, he claimed that he had never spoken to police. It seemed that Spar's alibi was a fake. The final blow in the case against Dennis Perry came in the spring of 2020, when a second DNA test was done on the hairs found with the glasses at the crime scene. Thanks to mitochondrial DNA provided by Eric Spar's mother Gladys, it was confirmed that the hairs belonged to her son. On July 17th, a judge granted a motion put forward by Perry's lawyers granting him a new trial. 
he was released from prison just days later, 20 years after his arrest for the murders of Harold and Thelma Swain. While Perry is a free man for the time being, it remains to be seen whether the state will attempt to retry him for the 1985 killings, or whether they will turn their attention back to Eric Sparr. Adding one final layer of mystery to the case is the fact that Gladys Sparr was found dead in her home just two days after Perry's new trial had been ordered. Police have not disclosed whether foul play was involved. This is definitely a case that we hope will be wrapped up in 2021. That brings us to the end of our list. Are there any other wrongful conviction cases that you'd like to see featured on the channel? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.